The following is a listener-supported ministry from the Grace Evangelical Society. You have tuned in to Grace in Focus, and we are so glad that you are here today for this question and answer edition. Have you ever wondered what repentance really is and what it is for? Is it really the same thing as faith or a part of faith for eternal salvation? Those are some of the things we'll be discussed today, and I know you'll want to stay tuned. Now, in a few minutes, I'll tell you how you can reach us at faithalone.org and what you can find there. But first, here's today's question and answer. Gentlemen? Welcome back to Grace in Focus. Steve, how's things going today? Couldn't be better. Now, we got some tough questions today. I think this is a great one. This is from David. He says, hey, Bob, I recently heard a sermon where the speaker was taking the phrase in 2 Corinthians 3.16, quote, when one turns to the Lord as repentance. And in the context, seems to be referring to gaining eternal life since the veil, like the ones Israel have, is of unbelief. And that veil is taken away. What is your view on this? Okay, why don't you read verses 15 and 16, and then we can talk about it. It says, But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart, talking about Israel. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. There was a pastor he heard say this, is that right? Right. What David's commenting on is, does a person repent, turn from his sins, and then he believes? Is repentance a necessary precursor to faith? That seems to be what this pastor was suggesting, right? It probably was, since that's how it's normally used. But it doesn't say, one, that everyone has to do this. Not at all. It says, when a person turns to the Lord, it's not the word repent, actually, it's the word epistrepho, to turn to the Lord. Right. When a person does this, the veil is taken away. Okay, so there's multiple things going on here. First of all, what does it mean to turn to the Lord? And secondly, what does it mean the veil is taken away? If the God of this world is blinding the eyes of people so that God has to take away that blinding. And that's just a few verses later, chapter 4, verse 3. All right, why don't you read that one? It says, but even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Okay, so let's talk about taking away the veil. According to 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4, when is a person born again? Before or after the veil is taken away? The veil has to be taken away to see the light. So a person believes after the veil is taken away. That's right. So therefore, the sequence goes, if we go back to 316, turning to the Lord, veil is taken away, belief occurs, regeneration occurs. Right. So a person is not born again when they turn to the Lord in 2 Corinthians 316. No. And they're not born again when the veil's taken away. Now, of course, logically, it's a nanosecond later they believe And at that same time, they're born again. So it's almost simultaneous. They're born again, aren't they, when the light is turned on? Right. Well, the light's always on, (laughs) but when they can see it. Well, only in that verse 6, right after this, chapter 4, verse 6. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. The moment that God says, in effect, let there be light, the moment, i.e., that we believe, It's an illumination, and that's when we're regenerating. But that light is shining all the time. The light's shining, but we can't see it. Because we're veiled. And why are we veiled? The God of this age has veiled us. Or blinded us. Blinded us. Yeah. Yeah. So here's what I would say is going on. When he says in verse 16 of 2 Corinthians 3, nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. I would suggest this turning to the Lord could be turning from sins. But it doesn't say that. As you said, it doesn't say when one repents, the veil is taken away. Mm -hmm. I would suggest there's lots of people who have repented, and yet the veil has not been taken away. So I think the turning to the Lord is one who is diligently seeking him. Uh, Hebrews 11, 6, God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Mm -hmm. Or Matthew 7, 7 to 11, ask, seek, knock. If we are responding to God's wooing us by turning to the Lord in the sense that we're seeking him, well, then the veil will be taken away. And I think a good illustration of that is Acts chapter 10. Cornelius and his household, they're God seekers. They're not believers yet, 
but they are seeking the Lord diligently. They're giving alms. They're praying. Their prayers go up as a memorial to the Lord. And what does the Lord do? He takes away the veil. Now, it doesn't say in verse 16, when one turns to the Lord, immediately the veil is taken away. In the case of Cornelius, he had probably turned to the Lord months or years before the veil was taken away. Mm -hmm. But Mm -hmm. the point is, if one turns to the Lord, God's going to take away the veil. And once he takes away the veil, belief occurs. And Calvinists have this crazy notion that people can't believe without receiving the gift of faith. The issue is not that we're incapable of believing. The issue is until the veil's taken away, we're incapable of seeing. That's right. I've had the ability to believe what God said all along. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, Calvinists will say an unbeliever is like a cadaver at the bottom of a well. And you can throw a rope down there and say, grab the rope, tie it around your waist, we'll pull you up. And the cadaver can't do anything. They don't even know what you're saying. Well, we're not like that. No. They would say, therefore, we're incapable of responding to God. I don't know how a Calvinist, if you ever ask them, how is it that an unbeliever can believe that God exists? Isn't that something spiritual? Isn't that something revealed in the Bible or revealed in Revelation? How is it that unbelievers can believe that Jesus is the Son of God, Mm -hmm. or that he died on the cross for their sins, or that he rose bodily from the dead, or that he was born in Bethlehem? Aren't all those things revealed in Scripture? So you're saying in Ephesians 2, dead are trespasses and sin, a dead person can believe. In fact, a dead person has to believe. But dead doesn't mean you're a dead cadaver in the uh, well, as you just said. It means that we're separated from God's life. Right. What I'm saying is, even before we believe in the free gift of everlasting life, we may believe a lot of true sure. things in the scriptures. And that's because the Spirit of God is working within us. I asked Zane Hodges one time how Paul can say, no one says Jesus is Lord mm-hmm. except by the Holy Spirit. I asked him, I said, that's a common confession by everybody in every branch of Christianity. Mm-hmm. All work salvation people say Jesus is Lord. All lordship salvation people say Jesus is Lord. Roman Catholics say Jesus is Lord. Eastern Orthodox, the Mormons say Jesus is Lord. The Jehovah's Witnesses say Jesus is Lord. And they're all sincere. Yeah. And his response, well, you know what it was? But they only did it by the Spirit of God. That's what he said. Yeah. You know, of course, since it says the Spirit will convict the world yeah. concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. I mean, even non-Christendom world, if you will, knows a lot of biblical truth and believes it because of the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. Right. What we're saying is turning to the Lord has to do with seeking the Lord. Cornelius is a perfect example And that puts you in a posture to believe and be able to believe. The veil's taken away so you can believe. And sure enough, as soon as God gives them the light of the gospel, like in Acts 10, 43, to him all the prophets bear witness that through his name whoever believes in him shall receive remission of sins. It says, as Peter was speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came down upon them. In other words, they believed the moment they were persuaded to the truth of Peter's words. In other words, as soon as God turned the light on, That's instantaneously with when they believe. Yeah, that's a good point. A few weeks ago in a Sunday school class that I teach, I was talking about Acts 16, 14, where it says, God opened Lydia's heart Mm -hmm. that she might heed the things spoken by Paul. Mm. I pointed out in the class that was essentially what you see in 2 Corinthians 4, 3, and 4, or Mm -hmm. 2 Corinthians 3, 16, Mm -hmm. the veil being taken away, the blinding being taken away. And my point was that when God opened Lydia's heart, that doesn't mean that she believed. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean she was born again. What that means is she now saw, and that resulted in her believing. Now, it was Mm -hmm. a nanosecond Mm -hmm. later, Mm -hmm. after he opened her heart, that she believed. But I think that's more or less the same thing here. And I see that as happening with every single person that comes to faith, even though we don't feel it, even though we don't actually realize it. Mm -hmm. You know, the word Eureka is the (laughs) Greek for I have found or I have found it. It's a perfect tense. Eurisco. Eurisco, yeah. yeah. In terms of finding it, it seems to me the moment of faith, we have that Eurisco kind of experience. Exactly what it is. I remember when I came to faith, I had invited Jesus in my heart hundreds of times between the ages of 12 and 20. Mm -hmm. But then when I was 20, I was confronted by a friend who said, Bob, is it possible your view of the gospel is wrong? So I prayed about it. 
because he had invited me to a college life meeting at his college. So I went and I heard some people talk about the grace of God and it seemed like, I don't know, easy believism, Mm -hmm. cheap grace. Mm -hmm. It just seemed wrong to Mm me. But I was intrigued because they were quoting scripture and it sounded like the scripture said what they were saying, even though they didn't deal with the tough ones. So then I contacted a campus crusade at my campus. The guy named Warren Wilkie came and talked with me and he kept hitting Ephesians 2, 8, 9. By grace, you've been saved through faith and that not of yourselves is the gift Mm -hmm. of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And he must have done that 10 times the first time we met. Mm -hmm. And I kept saying, what about Mm -hmm. Hebrews 6? Mm -hmm. What about Mm -hmm. Hebrews 10? What about James 2? He'd give a short answer, but whatever it is, and then he'd quote Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Broken record. We met a second time, like a day or two later. 10 more times he quoted Ephesians 2, 8, 9. A third time, a day or two later, quoted Ephesians 2, 8, 9. The fifth time we met, a week and a half later, he quoted it the 10th time, Mm. and my eyes were opened. Mm. And I believed. Yeah. And it was like all that inviting Jesus in business wasn't it. I realized at that moment, this is when I got it. Now, did I feel something? Mm -hmm. No, I just got it. Yeah. And why didn't I get it the first 49 times he quoted Ephesians 2, 8, 9? I don't know. Yeah. I had turned to the Lord a long time before, Mm -hmm. but finally at this point, he (laughs) took away the veil. And it's interesting you would mention Hebrews 6 and 10, because both of those passages use the word illumined. Wow. to describe our coming to faith. That's exactly what it is. That's good. When the lights are turned on, that's when we believed. And uh, it's a great word to describe when Cornelius or any of us came to faith, when we came to believe the truth of the gospel. Well, thank you, David, for your question. It was a very good one, and it got us to interact. I hope you found it helpful. If you want more articles, blogs, or podcasts, go to faithalone.org for a lot of free material. Keep grace in focus. Zane Hodge's book, The Gospel Under Siege, a study about faith and works intention, is being offered this month to Grace and Focus listeners and available right now at half price through June the 30th when you use the discount code word SIEGE, S-I-E-G-E. Find this special offer at faithalone.org. Would you be interested in some free e-books on topics you hear on this program? Well, if you are, you need to come visit us at faithalone.org. That's faithalone.org. On the site, we've got all kinds of free materials. But one of our popular options is our free ebooks on a range of subjects. They're designed to help you mature and grow in your understanding of the faith and scripture. So come visit us at faithalone.org. That's faithalone.org. We are so thankful for our financial partners who keep us on the air. Every gift is tax deductible and very much appreciated. If you'd like to find out how you can give, go to faithalone.org. Would you like to have a chat with Dr. Bob or one of the guests here on the program? Let me tell you how to reach out to the team. You can get us on our email address, which is radio at faithalone.org. That's radio at faithalone.org. Next time on Grace and Focus, what is the outer darkness? And is it related to the four soils of Luke 8? Please join us for that discussion. This is the Grace Evangelical Society reminding you to always keep grace in focus. The proceeding has been a listener-supported ministry from the Grace Evangelical Society.